Greetings, it's the Digital Dog, and in this video tutorial, I'm going to talk about the Photoshop color settings and the assign and convert to profile commands in Photoshop CC. So let's first start with the Photoshop color settings. There's six areas in the dialog to examine, and this is one of the most populated or option heavy areas of any dialog box anywhere in Photoshop. So the first thing to do is just to break everything down into groups. There are six areas that we're going to look at. At least two of them are very important for us to examine in detail. And actually the other ones, um, we're going to be able to skip over rather quickly because as you'll see when we go through them, they really don't need a whole lot of attention. So the first thing I'm going to suggest is that if you have Photoshop running for the first time, a new version of Photoshop, or if you've never examined the color settings, you want to forget the default settings that are, are going to show up in that dialog box. And if you do nothing more than simply select the North America Prepress 2 settings and move on and ignore everything else, you'll be in pretty good shape. I'll show you that in a moment. Here's the first part of our color settings. And we're going to bounce back and forth between these slides and actual color settings in Photoshop. The first thing that I want to point out is that you may see a slightly different user interface than is shown here in this particular screen capture and that we're going to see in Adobe Photoshop CC 2017. Now all of the options I'm going to show you have been around for years and years and years. The only difference is how Adobe has sort of redrawn this dialog box. So if your copy looks a little bit different than this, don't worry. All of the options that you're going to look at are still pertinent. So we're going to go into Adobe Photoshop and look at this first setting called Settings. So in Adobe Photoshop, just go into the Edit, scroll down to Color Settings, and you can see that there's a key command. On the Mac, it's Command-Shift-K. On Windows, it's Control-Shift-K. And this is going to call up your color settings. So the first area that we want to talk about is something called Settings. And this is where I was mentioning that if you do nothing else, if you simply come down here and pick one of these presets called North America Prepress 2, everything in this dialog box is going to repopulate with new particular settings. So for example, we could go into monitor color, which is a very bad idea, and we'll talk about why. Or you could pick Japan color for newspaper, and as you can see, everything updates. And then you can make your own settings by simply configuring them and hitting the Save button. And that's what I've done for myself, I have a setting called AR settings. So I'll show you the difference between what I have and the settings that I recommend if you do nothing else, which is called the North America Prepress 2 settings. It's going to populate everything in this dialog box with sound, reasonable settings, and you can just hit OK and move on. So this is a pretty simple setting right here. This is the first of six areas we're going to look at. So it allows us to configure all of the settings throughout the dialog box, and these settings can be saved and reloaded. They can even be shared across multiple computer systems if you simply save the saved file and load it on another computer. Okay, now we're going to look at something very important called working spaces. We're going to spend a little time here because the next two areas of this dialog are rather important. What we're going to do here is we're going to select our preferred color space for these four different color models. As you can see, there's RGB, CMYK, gray, and spot. And I would think for most users, RGB is what you're going to be concentrating on the most. What you're really doing here is you're telling Photoshop when it makes a new document or when it opens a document, these are the color spaces you prefer to work in. You don't have to work in them. You can change your mind at any time, but you're basically telling Photoshop how you prefer to be working. And when we get into the next area, color management policies, you'll see how this sort of applies between the working space and the policies. So essentially, you'll see in AR settings, the difference between what I have in my custom settings versus the prepress is that I've set mine to Profoto RGB. If I move from the default North America prepress settings to my custom settings, one of the big differences is that I've changed my RGB working space, my preferred RGB working space, to Profoto RGB. And I hit OK. So why would we pick one RGB working space over another? Well, in the first module, we talked a lot about color spaces. We talked about color gamut. The first thing to understand is that the preferred RGB working space that you set in your color settings is used when you create a new document. That's going to be the default. 
And it's going to be the RGB working space that Photoshop is going to look for when you open up all subsequent documents. Now, I recommend Profoto RGB because it's the widest color gamut working space, and it's really recommended for working with raw workflows. Later on in another module, when we look at Adobe Camera Raw, I'll show you why that's the case. But for now, I'm just going to state that I think that Profoto RGB is the RGB working space that most people should be working at a default if they're coming from a raw workflow. Now, if you're a web designer and you're never doing anything but posting images to the web or mobile devices, then you probably want to set this for sRGB. And there's something called untagged documents, documents that don't have an embedded profile. That's going to be a problem, as we alluded in the earlier modules, because there's no scale associated with the numbers. So whenever you open up an untagged document, which is always bad news, Photoshop has to make some sort of assumption about what the color space is for those numbers. Photoshop assumes what you select in these RGB working spaces or CMYK working spaces in your color settings. If I were to open an untagged RGB document, which is something we always want to avoid, Photoshop would assume that the scale of those numbers are Profoto RGB. If I were working an sRGB set here and I opened up an untagged document, Photoshop would assume the numbers are associated with sRGB. And that's the same for CMYK, which we'll talk about, gray, and spot. So once again, if you open up an untagged document, Photoshop has to come up with some sort of assumption for what those numbers mean. And it uses the color space that you select here in Working Space. How do you know that Photoshop is using your display profile, the one that you named when you calibrated your display? Well, that's something you can also see in the RGB Working Space setup in your color settings. All you have to do is go into the RGB Working Space drop-down menu, and you'll see at the top something that is labeled monitor RGB slash, and then there's going to be a name. You can see here that the name PA272W is the profile that I've named after I've calibrated my NEC display. If you call yours a particular name, you'll see it showing up here. You never want to select this for an RGB working space. That's very, very important. The only reason that it's here is to show you that Photoshop has recognized your display profile and it's using it for preview purposes. If you recall, I talked about how Photoshop uses something called display using monitor compensation, where it's very important that Photoshop have access to the ICC profile that describes your display. And you're seeing here in this drop-down menu that Photoshop is indeed seeing, in this case, my display profile. So now let's look at the next option, which is called Working Space CMYK. If you were working with a CMYK profile that you wanted to use to convert RGB to CMYK, you could load this in this area of the Photoshop color settings. And again, you're simply telling Photoshop that this is the CMYK color space that you prefer to use. If you're never working with CMYK files, you can pretty much ignore this. Now, we're going to look at another command later on called the Convert to Profile command. And that allows us to select any CMYK profile or any RGB profile or any grayscale profile we want. And it has a lot more useful features than what we're going to see when we convert in another area called mode change. And I'll talk about that in a minute. The most important working space to set is going to be for RGB. For CMYK, as I said, you can select any profile that you may have loaded on your machine and that's going to be used in another area that we'll talk about. The same is true for dot, gain, and spot, which I'll talk about. If you never work with these particular type of color models, you can pretty much ignore what goes into this drop-down menu. So even though we can load a CMYK profile here and use it in our CMYK working space drop-down, we're going to work with the convert to profile command, which I'll show you later on in this module. It has a lot of advantages, allowing us to also preview what the conversion is going to look like before we actually make that conversion. We talked about untagged documents without embedded profiles for RGB, and the same is true here. If you load a CMYK profile in the CMYK Working Space drop-down menu, and someone were to hand you an untagged CMYK color file, Photoshop's going to assume that the color numbers are in the color space that you load here. Working Space Grayscale. There's basically two settings here. One's called Gamma, which is what you would use if you wanted to convert a file to be previewed grayscale on a grayscale display. 
I don't think too many people are doing that these days. There are very few grayscale displays out there that we need to worry about, but I do need to tell you what that's for. You can load a CMYK profile there if you wanted, and it will use the CMYK profile's black generation for converting to this grayscale setting. But again, I don't think that's something that most people are going to use. So basically, in our gray drop-down menu, we have the option to use dot gain settings or gamma settings. Gamma settings are for converting a file to grayscale to view on a grayscale display, which is something I doubt very few people are doing these days, but that's why it's there. The dot gain settings are used to convert a color image to a single channel grayscale file for being printed on a device that only prints one color, that would be black. And what you would need to know is what is the dot gain setting for that particular press or printer. That's really the only difference here. And again, if you're not ever working with grayscale documents, single color channel documents, you don't ever have to worry about what's being set here. So again, when you select grayscale in this particular area and you pick a dot gain setting, it's going to convert the color from RGB to grayscale. Now, this is not the way you want to convert a file if you're printing on a color device like an inkjet printer. This is the type of grayscale file that you would send maybe to a newspaper press that only prints with one color of black ink. Now we're going to get on to the third area, which is one of the most important areas of the color settings, which is called color management policies. And as you see, I have all three of my policies set for preserve embedded profile, and I have the three warning checkbox turned on. And I highly recommend that you do this as well. Let me explain what's going on here. What the RGB, CMYK, and grayscale policies do is they let Photoshop determine what it should do if you open a document that isn't in one of the color spaces listed above for working space. So let's take a look at this in Photoshop proper. As you can see, I have my RGB working space dropdown set for Profoto RGB. And if I open up a document in Profoto RGB, it's simply going to open up on screen without any particular issue whatsoever. If I have an RGB document that isn't in Profoto RGB, I have three options. Off, preserve embedded profile, and convert to working RGB. So as you can see, I have it set to preserve embedded profile. If I open up a document that is not in Profoto RGB, what Preserve Embedded Profile will do is it will simply open the document in that color space. So let's take a look at this. I'll say OK, and I'm going to open up a document, my 2014 printer test file, and it simply opens on screen. And you'll notice that the document is in Adobe RGB 1998. By the way, if you want to set that down below, you just click on that little flyout triangle and you select Document Profile. And now it shows me the color space of this particular document. And because I had my policy set to preserve, Photoshop says, OK, I know that we want to always be working with Profoto RGB. What happens if we open a document that's in a different color space? What we're going to do is preserve the embedded profile in that document. Now, let's say I go into my color settings, and instead of preserve, I turn this to convert to working RGB. This is fairly dangerous. What is going to happen is that Photoshop is going to automatically convert that document from its original color space into the color space I've listed above. In other words, Profoto RGB. So if I select this and hit OK, and I open this up, the very first time, Photoshop's going to say, do you really want to do this? It's going to remind me, the image that you're trying to open is in Adobe RGB 1998. The working space that you've set is Profoto RGB. If I do something dangerous like don't show this again and hit OK, what's going to happen is the document is automatically converted from Adobe RGB 1998 to Profoto RGB. And that's a dangerous setting that you may not want automatically occurring. That's the reason that I recommend that you always use preserve. And then, as you'll see, we never want to have any of these settings set to off. What off does is basically attempt to ignore color management, and it's really, really dangerous. So if I were to set this to off, Photoshop is just going to ignore all of this information that we've set up above. And you can see there's an off setting for each one of these, and you absolutely do not want 
the off policies. Very dangerous. So let's just reset everything by toggling to my original settings. And we have everything set to preserve embedded profile. So to make sure we're all on the same page here, the preserve embedded profile policy is always going to allow you open the image in the profile that the document really exists in. It's not going to try to convert it to another color setting based on what we have above for working space. It's going to preserve the colors as they are. We can always convert them later on, but when you open a document, generally the safest thing to do is to have it open in the color space that it was really originally created in. And this is the most important area to understand. Now let's look at these check boxes down below. As I said, if in doubt, always leave them on. When you're more comfortable, you can turn them off to speed things up or to ensure that you don't have dialog boxes popping up that you don't really want to see. Let me show you what they do. So I have this checkbox turned on. If I open a document in Profoto RGB, it's just going to open. There's not going to be anything that occurs because we don't have a profile mismatch. But if I have the Ask When Opening checkbox on, look what happens if I now open this document that we saw was in Adobe RGB 1998. It gives me the Embedded Profile Mismatch dialog box. And you can never do any harm if you have this on and set to the Preserve policy because what's going to happen is this top radio button is going to be the default. Use the Embedded Profile instead of the Working Space. So what this is telling Photoshop is the Embedded Profile is Adobe RGB 1998. My preferred RGB Working Space is Profoto RGB. And because I have the policy set to preserve, this radio button is set to use the embedded profile. Preserve it. And if I hit OK, the document opens in its original color space. So let me show you what happens if we do something that's a little bit more dangerous. We're going to go into our color settings, and we're going to set this to convert to working RGB. Hit OK. Open this again. And now you'll see that the second radio button automatically selected. Convert document's color space to the working space. If I hit OK, the document is going to be converted from Adobe RGB 1998 to Profoto RGB. And I really don't want that to happen. But I'll show you that it does indeed do that. You can see the document is in Profoto RGB. So this is the reason why we want to have our policy set to preserve. And if we have this warning checkbox on, we can't do any harm. It's always going to open with that first radio button set. And it's always going to allow us to preserve the color space of the document as we wanted it. Let me just quickly show you what happens if we use the dreaded off policy. I'll click OK. And I'll open this again. And open the file. And say OK it's going to discard the embedded profile. It thinks it's not really color managing, which isn't the case. This is very, very dangerous. This is going to produce an untagged document. You can see untagged RGB. This is what we could call RGB mystery meat. And if you notice, the color preview looks really awful. Why is that? Well, look what happens if I open up my color settings. And I'll move them over a little bit. It thinks that this document which is not in Profoto RGB, we've seen that it was in Adobe RGB 1998, it thinks the document is in Profoto RGB. Because as I said, the RGB settings that you place here are what Photoshop uses as the assumption for the numbers in this untagged document. If I were to simply toggle this to Adobe RGB, it looks much better. Because now the scale of these numbers and the scale associated with those numbers is correct. If I go back to my original settings, the preview on screen changes because Photoshop is now assuming that this data is in Profoto RGB when it's not. So as you can see, the off policy is very dangerous. It strips the profile out of the data and makes our images look very ugly. And it's really a bad idea. So if you're tired of seeing that dialog come up and warn you all the time that the profile that you may be opening doesn't match what you have here, you can turn this off. But as I said, I'd leave it on initially. We have two other warnings, ask when pasting and ask when opening missing profiles.
Basically, what this is going to do, and I think this is very important, if you open up a document that does not have an embedded profile, Photoshop will pop a warning. So let's take a look at that real quickly. If I open up this document again and it doesn't have an assigned profile, Photoshop pops the missing profile dialog box. And it says, I can't find an ICC profile in this document. What do you want me to do? Leave as is, just open the document, or assign a profile to this particular document. We're going to talk about the assign profile command in a minute, but this basically is going to do the same thing. It's going to say, what I want you to do is I want you to assign or tag this ICC profile to the document. If you happen to know, as we do, that this document is in Adobe RGB, we can simply select Assign Profile and pick that in the drop-down menu. Select OK, and as you can see, now the document has been embedded and tagged with Adobe RGB. I'm going to click Save, so now this is not an untagged document. But the point being, the missing profile ask when opening is very useful. It's always going to look to see if there's an embedded profile, and if there isn't, it's going to ask you to assign a profile so that the RGB or CMYK or spot or grayscale numbers have an ICC profile that defines its color space. Lastly, let's look at ask when pasting. I'm going to open up another document. In this case, this image is in Profoto RGB. This image is in Adobe RGB, 1998. If I come along here, and make a selection, and, and then edit, copy, then come over to this document and select edit, paste, I'm going to get the paste profile mismatch dialog. And essentially what it's telling me is the data in my clipboard is in Adobe RGB 1998, and the document I'm trying to paste into is Profoto RGB. And I have two options here, convert, which means convert the data from Adobe RGB to Profoto RGB to preserve the color appearance, which is really what we always want. The other option is don't convert, preserve the color numbers. So I'll give you an example and show you what the differences are. 99 times out of 100, you're going to say convert because you want the color that you see here to be maintained over here. If I hit OK, you can see that the color matches. In order for the color to match, Photoshop had to convert from Adobe RGB 1998 to Profoto RGB in order to put this information into the new document and maintain its color. If instead I paste and I say don't convert, preserve the color numbers, you can see the color does not look correct. That's exactly why you want to have the Ask When Pasting checkbox on. It's going to let you control how you convert from one color space to the other to maintain the color. color policies. They control the behavior for documents that don't match what you set in your RGB, CMYK, or grayscale working spaces. And the preserve policy is going to make sure that we can open documents in different color spaces without forcing them into another color space. The convert policy that we saw tries to force the RGB working space that you've set in your color settings on anything that you may open. And it's going to do it automatically. Now there are some workflows where that might be very useful and speed up production, but it's going to happen behind the scenes. All your documents are going to be converted as they open into that color space, and it's a bit dangerous. So that's why I always recommend use the preserve policy until you understand how all this works. And the off policy is never recommended. Always have your checkboxes set to on. One warns about missing profiles, so that if you do open a document without a profile, you can then understand that what you're seeing on screen may not be the correct preview. You need to associate the right profile with the right numbers. It lets you know if there are profile mismatches. So if you open up a document in sRGB and your preferred working space is Profoto RGB, you'll be aware of that. You can make a decision after the fact, but at least you know when you open the document it's not in Profoto RGB. And as we saw, the paste mismatches is a function of converting one color space to another color space when we copy and paste between documents that are in different color spaces. So these checkboxes are your safety net. You can turn them off, but I wouldn't do so until you're very, very comfortable with how they all operate. So now let's look at the 
fourth area in the color settings. And this is one we can pretty much ignore, and I'll tell you why. Here we have settings for how we're going to convert from one color space to another color space when we use the image mode dialog. You can see that in the lower left. So if I were in RGB and I selected image mode CMYK, these settings are going to be invoked. It's going to use what's called the Adobe Ace Engine. And that's simply the engine used to convert colors. There are different engines out there, but I suggest that you always select Adobe Ace. It's also going to force this rendering intent, in this case relative color metric, on the conversions. So if I convert from one color space to the other using the mode menu, it's always going to use the Adobe Ace engine and it's always going to use relative color metric. But as you'll see when we get into the convert to profile dialog, we can select anything that we want available to us and we don't have to worry about this particular setting. The same is true for black point compensation, dither, and compensate for seam referred profiles. Basically, in a nutshell, you always want to use black point compensation. It is part of the advantage of the Adobe Ace Engine. We really don't have time to go into the nitty gritty. What it does is it makes sure that when you convert from one color space to the other, that the darkest black is converted correctly. There's no reason to ever turn it off. Use Dither only applies when we're converting from one color space to the other when we're using 8-bit per color documents. So if you're working with 16-bit color files, that isn't going to apply at all. Dither, for lack of a better term, is going to add a little bit of noise so that when you convert from one color space to the other, you're going to get smoother gradations. So there's no reason not to have that on. I leave it on all the time. And compensate for seam referred profiles is for very special class of profiles that very few people are going to be working with. And again, there's no reason not to have that checkbox on. But the conversion options here really are not going to be used because we're going to always do our conversions in the convert to profile command, which I'm going to show you coming up. So the only time that you're going to have these settings apply is when you use the mode change under image, and we're just not going to use that. Now we move on to the advanced controls, and basically what I can say is just don't go there. These are really somewhat dangerous buttons to play with. I would leave them at their default. The desaturate monitor colors checkbox should always be off. What it tries to do is desaturate the monitor, which will then hose the quality of your profile display so that colors that are out of monitor gamut can be seen. It's really a strange little kludge that I don't recommend anybody ever use. And I'm only mentioning it because every now and then that somebody will turn on the checkbox and then they'll report oh, everything on screen looks really wrong and weird, and I recalibrated my display and everything looks wrong in Photoshop. That's probably because that desaturate monitor colors by percentage checkbox is on. In fact, if you hover over the desaturate monitor colors by, you'll see a description down below, and it tells you that if this is set, your monitor display isn't going to match the printed output. So definitely turn that off. The same is true for this blend RGB colors using gamma. The best thing I can suggest is just leave it off. It's not something that most people are going to ever use when they're working with images. It's more for scientific analysis of colors. And the blend text colors, I would leave at the default of 1.45. What it really does is control how we're applied when you're using the text tool. Just leave the default and move on. The last area, and we actually just looked at it, is description, and that's pretty self-explanatory. As you hover your tool over any of the settings above, you'll get a description of what these settings are supposed to do for you. So as we saw, if I move my cursor over relative color metric, it gives me a description of what relative color metric rendering intent is supposed to do. Use dither, 8-bit channel, it tells me that it's going to add a little bit of noise to reduce banding and artifacts, and so on. So again, custom presets, anything that we want to create. Working space, the preferred color space for RGB, CMYK, grayscale, and spot. Very important are our color management policies. As I said, we always want to preserve embedded profiles. And ideally, when you're first starting out, let's have all of our checkboxes on. Conversion options, we're not going to ever have to worry about them. We're going to do our conversions elsewhere in Photoshop, an area that has a lot more control. And the advanced settings, we're just going to leave alone. And lastly, descriptions. 
Let's talk about soft proofing. We need to define what that means as we move on and look at images on screen when we convert them. And the soft proof is basically a on-screen simulation of what the image will appear as before you convert the image to another color space. And this is why it's so important to have our display calibrated and profiled and use good ICC profiles. So when we look at the upcoming convert to profile command and assign profile command, we're going to be able to see on screen how the image is going to change based on the different parameters we're going to use in these dialog boxes. And that's called a soft proof. So first we're going to look at the assign profile command. And I kind of showed it to you when we saw the missing profile dialog come up and I was able to tell the missing profile dialog this is the profile that is associated with these numbers. One of the things that's important to understand is that Photoshop uses the currently selected ICC profile that you set in your color settings as an assumption for untagged documents. And I showed you that earlier, but let's take a look one more time. So here's an untagged document in Photoshop, and the color looks really wrong. It looks totally oversaturated. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go under my Edit menu and pick Assign Profile. And it shows me that this document does not have a color profile. That's the default. I could select my RGB working space that's set in my color settings, but it still doesn't look right because this document isn't in Profoto RGB. We saw earlier it's in Adobe RGB 1998. So I can select any profile I have on my machine. And what's interesting is that no matter what I select, the color appearance updates on screen. The numbers are not changing. The RGB numbers are all staying the same no matter what I select here. But because Photoshop is associating a new profile with those numbers, the color appearance changes. And once again, as I said, we know that this document is in Adobe RGB 1998. And if I select Adobe RGB 1998, the color appearance on screen looks as it should. And we talked about soft proof. You'll notice there's a preview checkbox here. I can't imagine why you would ever turn that off. So when it's on, you're actually seeing the soft proof. You're seeing how the numbers and this new profile are going to change the preview on screen. And that's our soft proof. So I'm going to select Adobe RGB 1998, select OK. And if I save this document, Adobe RGB 1998 is then embedded inside this document, and next time I open it, it will preview correctly. So that's all the assign profile command really does. And if all of your images had the correct ICC profile embedded in them, you'd never ever need to use the assign profile command. So you're going to use the assign profile command to hopefully embed the correct ICC profile for untagged documents. It doesn't change the numbers, it changes the meaning of the numbers, it changes the scale of the numbers, it changes the definition. And if you have the right definition and the right numbers, the color preview is going to be correct. You never want to select don't color manage this document because what that's going to do is it's going to actually remove the ICC profile from that document if you click OK. We saw the color space in section two of our color settings. That's automatically appearing here. It says working RGB, pro photo RGB. And we would select that middle radio button if indeed the document was in pro photo RGB. But in this case, it wasn't. In this case, we had to select the ICC profile that actually defines those RGB numbers. It happened to have been Adobe RGB 1998. And very often, you're not going to know what ICC profile really should be assigned because somebody sent you a document without an embedded profile. So you may have to try some different options in this drop down menu and pick the one that appears best on screen. Then you hit OK. So the assign profile command is necessary if somebody is providing untagged documents, images that do not have an embedded profile. And the best thing to do is ask them, what color space is this particular image? And please don't send me documents that have no embedded profile. I'm working in a color managed workflow. It'd be necessary if people were sending you images that had the wrong embedded profile, but that's really rare that somebody's going to do that. Nonetheless, if they did, you could fix the issue by assigning the correct ICC profile to the image data.
And with images that don't have an ICC profile, you kind of have to guess which is the right ICC profile by assigning different profiles and looking at them on screen. I'd suggest that you try sRGB first and foremost. Most untagged documents are going to be in sRGB. Now let's look at the convert to profile command. This is different from the assign profile command. It's actually used to convert from one color space to another color space. And we're going to do that often in a color managed workflow. So unlike the assign profile command, it not only changes the way the images appear on screen, it changes the numbers as well. And we saw this occur when we were using the paste mismatch dialog and we said go ahead and convert from, in the example I showed you, Adobe RGB to Profoto RGB. Same idea, change the numbers. We can use the convert to profile command for any conversions, RGB to CMYK, RGB to RGB, CMYK to RGB, etc. Let's take a look at this. So here's an image that is in Adobe RGB 1998. And let's say we want to convert it to sRGB because we're going to put it up on a web page. We simply come in here and we say convert to profile, which is just below assign profile. This dialog box comes up. It tells us the source profile. So in case you don't happen to have this indicated down below, the convert to profile will tell you that the current document is in Adobe RGB. And then we can pick any profile it happens to be on our computer. So if I wanted to convert this to sRGB, I would just set sRGB and click OK. And as you can see, the image got converted from Adobe RGB to sRGB. You'll notice on screen it changed a little bit. Let's take a look at this dialog again and see what other options we have. One of the things that we can do is change the rendering intent. Now, if you're working with these particular ICC profiles like Adobe RGB, Color Match, Profoto, Apple, the only option that is really going to work is relative color metric. Yes, you can select perceptual, and you can select saturation, and you can select absolute color metric, but you don't see any change on screen. We have our soft proof on. And the reason is that these simple working space profiles only have one rendering intent table, which is relative color metric. So it doesn't really matter what you pick there. But let's look what happens if I want to convert this to a profile going out to my printer on matte paper. So if I toggle between perceptual and saturation and relative color metric, and well, let's even use absolute color metric, you can see each time I toggled the rendering intent, the color on screen changed. And that's because I have a soft proof. I want to make sure that this preview dialog box is always on. If it's off and I toggle, nothing happens. That's really useless. So let's pick another profile. Let's say that we want to convert to CMYK and we're going out to a sheet fed coated press. And again, you'll notice that the color changes on screen because of the soft proof. I can change the rendering intent and you can see the colors on screen are slightly different. Begging the question, which one of these should you use? And the answer is really simple. The one that produces the best color appearance. As you saw, the convert to profile command provides a soft proof. It gives us a preview on screen based on our settings, which is really useful. That's something that the mode change does not do when we rely on the color settings alone. That's why I recommend you use the convert to profile command whenever you want to make color space conversions instead of using mode change. So once again, you select the profile that you want for conversion. Always select the engine for Adobe Ace. There's no reason to use anything but Adobe Ace. Pick the rendering intent based on how you prefer the image appearance on screen. And remember that there are some profiles that no matter what you select are always going to show you the same color appearance because they don't have a perceptual table or a saturation table. They're always going to use the color metric table. Always have black point compensation on. Keep an eye on the flatten image to preserve color appearance checkbox. You may or may not want to flatten an image if it has layers. You may want to have that checkbox on or off depending on your workflow. So convert to profile and rendering intents. 
I mentioned that not all profiles have a perceptual or a saturation rendering intent. All printer profiles are going to have that particular table. So if you're working with any type of a profile going out to a printer, you should always toggle between the various rendering intents and see what you prefer on screen. So if you're converting between, say, Profoto RGB and sRGB or any of the RGB working spaces, no matter what you pick, you're going to end up getting a relative colorimetric intent. Remember in our first module, we talked about gamut clipping versus gamut compression. When you're using printer profiles, all the rendering intents are available and you have that option to either compress the gamut or clip the gamut. So just toggle between the two and pick the one that looks best on screen based on the soft proof. ICC profiles know nothing about color and context. They only know about individual color pixel values. You, the image creator, know how you want the image to appear. So toggle the different rendering intents and pick the one that looks best to you on screen.